round of applause to close this very moving uh, moment. Many years, just the first. of applause for Maria Noel Richetto. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot see, I cannot see. Oh, you danced very well. As we have foreign guests, I will very briefly tell them that we are here with a Uruguayan with a wonderful trajectory, a great dancer who for 13 years was a member of the American Ballet, uh, also received awards from the Bolshoi in Moscow, which is the Oscar for dancers. And she's the current director of the National Ballet team of Uruguay. I'm a little nervous. So let us go back to Maria Noel's long trajectory. It's a road full of success, experiences with sacrifice, effort, apart from success. Uruguayans know about this. But let us start at the very beginning. You were born and raised in the city of Durazno. Your father was a farmer. Weren't you the type of a typical girl who dance and wants to go to uh, ballet classes? How did you discover your vocation? Well, I, I was born in Montevideo, but my father was from the province of Durazno. And when they married, my parents went to live uh, in that rural town. And so my early childhood was in Durazno. And we came to Montevideo when I started school. And uh, at one point, I had to start doing something. And while my mother was working, I had to do something else. And my mother loved Bali. And there was a school near my house, so I went uh, to Bali classes uh, while other people went to swimming classes. Maybe at that time you never thought how that decision would mark your life forever. Well, in your case, that was a um, vocation, and you gradually fell in love with the discipline. Well, I started like a hobby. It was just um, to kill time, if you like. But they discovered I had conditions. And after I finished that first year, the ballet teacher told my mother she must go to the National Dance School, which belongs to a local organization, institution. And they had uh, yearly auditions for the students. It's a free of charge education. So you go to an audition. So in the first year, um, the teacher told my mother, and I did not want to leave my class with her. I was feeling comfortable where I was. I didn't want to leave the academy. And on the second year, the teacher insisted. And then my mother said, 
Look, everybody tells me that you should go to the National Ballet School, so let us try and see what happens. Uh, and I went there, and there were lots of girls, yes, hundreds of girls attending, and 27 were shortlisted. And, and we studied for eight years, and three of us completed the course. Uh, it's a hard road, right? Yes, it implies sacrifice. You have to leave many things behind. But my family supported me. And within the school, there was a structure that uh, supported me and made it possible for me to continue. Apart from the love and passion that I started feeling with this discipline. Well, as you say, um, at the age of eight, you were already dancing at that school, and so your life changed. It started as a game and then became something else. Tell us about the yellow tapper, tupperware when you were eight. Well, I remember that <laughs> yellow tupperware. My mother uh, would pick me up at school. I left uh, school at one. And at two, I joined the ballet school. So I had to go from Carrasco to the to town. And she brought me an enormous um, meal in a Tupperware. It was huge, yellow. It was big, and it had lots of food. One was for me, the other was for my sister. And we had to eat while riding the car. And. It's about 45 minutes from my house to the school, and we had to change in the car. And we were ready to start exercising uh, in the class. And that lasted a long time. My school years, um, I remember my school years as having lunch in the car. And I always had to eat very quickly. And even today, I keep the same rhythm to eat every time. It, I, I was marked by that. So at the time, you got together with your friends, and you had to sacrifice that meeting with your friends because you had to spend the, the whole afternoon at the school. Well, yes, that's a common denominator of dancers if you want to become a prima ballerina, you, there comes a point when all the um, out-of-school activities were not for me. I had to practice. I had rehearsals during the weekend, so I couldn't join the rest of my friends in their outings. So my routine was around ballet, and at the time, my training as a dancer. At no point I felt it like a burden. Or when it became a burden and I started doubting about my choice, my passion and my love for ballet won. And I always ended up choosing ballet. So those sacrifices, the things you had to abandon, continued. And then when you, what happened when you were in high school? You had to do uh, third and fourth grade without attending classes because um, when other young people, adolescents, were enjoying being together with friends and classmates, you were not able to do that. But uh, um, so that was the price you paid. How did you? How do you remember that? I don't remember much. That was a long time ago. But I felt that was what I had to do to become a dancer. So at home, um, everybody was very strict in this sense. If you continue with ballet, you will continue studying as well. So it was not a choice. There was no gray area. It was either black or white. You do both or none. So. When I had to complete uh, high school, I received a scholarship to go to the US.
It was then that, well, I had, I didn't speak English at all. That's very funny indeed, because at present, uh, well, English is, is something that uh, forms part of, of my life at all levels. But at that time, when um, it, you had to choose between English or French or English and Italian, I would choose any other language except English. And then suddenly, I realized that uh, the scholarship was to go to the US. And I needed English, because everybody became mad and said, well, um, start uh, one of those uh, hyper-intensive English courses. And, and, and that's when I had to choose. And, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going ahead of your questions, probably. But this is a monologue, as you can see. No, that's fine. They are all here to listen to you. But let me give you some idea. If this is interesting, because at school, um, you started collecting uh, a, a salary uh, and, and you, you asked, am I going to be paid? And, uh, and then you had uh, this uh, talent hunter from Hungary came uh, to Montevideo, discovered Maria Noel, detected immediately that there was a lot of talent there. And she was offered an, uh, uh, a scholarship to go to North Carolina in the US to continue her dancing courses. Uh, so that was a challenge of English, and we're going to go over that. But it also m m was very shocking for you because we, you were an adolescent, a teenager, and uh, and it was it was very moving. I mean, there were two offers. The first one you couldn't take it. Well, I was 14 years old, and uh, at, at 14 years old at that time, it's not the same as 14 year old now. And I was a child, and. Um, uh, we were a very united family, and uh, and and to start thinking that I was going to leave uh, to another place I didn't know with another language, and I was not going to have my mother and my father, and my sister. Well, uh, was a turmoil for me. And uh, a month before going, I would cry my heart out, and I would go to bed and cry. And so my father uh, stopped everything. If, if this girl is suffering in this way a month before, you're not going. She's not going. And so that scholarship was put in a sort of pause. And that's when I had to uh, carry out my third year of high school as a free student, uh, not uh, uh, as, as a curricular student, and then I uh, completed it and went and then I went to the ballet school. And then Sodre, which is the national ballet of Uruguay, is not, uh, was not what uh, it is now. The story was quite different. It was a lot of effort and very little budget. And, uh, and so I started, uh, you know, having this bug inside, you know. It wasn't that tangible then, but the possibility of going somewhere else and see other things and learn from other masters. And I didn't want to stay and keep that question in me and think about what it could have been. And so we reactivated that possibility. And um, it happened. And so I left when I was 17, almost 18. So with a, a, a mother and a father who were all the time present, your sister, a very uni united family, as you just said, you ended up by traveling to the US. And as you said, without knowing English, you learned by, uh, when I didn't understand and I didn't learn anything in that intensive course, I, I realized I didn't know anything. I learned by watching TV. And I lived in uh, in the house of, of my master and his family. And uh, every day after dinner, every evening, he would sit down with a notebook and do uh, build sentences. It was very special, you know. And, and then, of course, in those first months, I couldn't understand a thing. Uh, with, I was using my gestures. It was very basic until I got 
to the US, you know. I said, hello, my name is Maria. I speak slowly because I don't understand English. That's the, the only thing I could say then in the, uh, during the flight to the US. And that flight was also difficult because in Sao Paulo, you called back and then you started crying. And there's a very significant scene because your mother and your father had different roles. Uh, Montevideo, Sao Paulo. Yes, well, my father said, well, little darky, come back. Come back if you don't want to be there. And my mother would pick up the phone and said, Mariano, it is just one year. You come back for Christmas and uh, we can go and pay you a visit. You carry on, carry on. This is what you want to do. And, and so they, they went mad. But I got to the U.S., but in uh, several ports, I would call back home crying. Yes, there were many tears. And when you were in the US, there were many tears. But a piece of advice was given to you by someone uh, you love. And, and he said, well, I still practice that. Th this was a director from Sodre. She told me, it was a Cuban, and she told me, she wrote a letter, a very beautiful letter, at a time when I was missing my family a lot, when I was in the US. And she said, when you are sad and when you want to cry, uh, cry under the shower because everything is going to flow out. It's very therapeutical if you haven't tried it out. It works fine. Very well. The thing is that you went to the US for one year and you stayed 15 years. You were 17, and so very basic uh, calculations. You became an adult, and from Carolina, North Carolina, you you were auditioning in the American Ballet, uh, and from Uruguay, that was something that uh, was unreachable. But you were there. Well, yes, I think that I was. I I believe a lot in good luck. And I think that uh, there is something there that, uh, well, means luck. Uh, but then there is a lot of work. It's your destiny. There's a lot of risk. I don't know. Uh, this had to happen to me. I couldn't even believe it myself. Uh, at a certain point in time, my scholarship was about to expire, and I had to start uh, auditions. That's where all, all students have the possibility of sending out their CVs, of uh, doing auditions so that they see you and get a job. And I remember that all my um, schoolmates were uh, taking out pictures and writing CVs. And, uh, um, and I told my teacher then, uh, I said, I'm going to audition for large companies because because if I don't go in, I go, I go back to Uruguay and I start doing something else. In my mind, I was going to be a lawyer because I was going to come back to Uruguay. I always like the law and um, I can't think of you as a lawyer. Well, I, I, it would have been good, I think. Um, it's never late, it's never late. I had planned everything, and uh, but very back in my mind, I, I could hear myself saying, "You're never going to be hired by a large company," and uh, and you have to study. But at that time, the national ballot of Euro wasn't a possibility, you know. So you went to New York on your own, and yes, I went on my own. And they, uh, um, well, I could, I could give a private audition. We were four from the school. And well, uh, they saw me and, uh, and they said, well, if you can wait until noon, for instance, I, I don't know, it was early in the morning. If you can wait until noon, uh, the, uh, uh, the director's assistant told me, uh, I would like to talk to you. And, uh, and I said, OK, I can wait. And I never thought what was going to happen. And then, then I waited until noon. I sat down with her. And she said, I have a contract. I would like to offer you a contract for next year. And there are two possibilities. You either start straight away in two weeks, 
and then you would take the last part of the season as an extra dancer. And then next year, we hire you as part of the ballet uh, group, or you start next year as a ballet dancer. And there, sitting down, I said, no, I'll start next year as a part of the um, ballet group, not as an extra dancer. And then I came out of that place, and I called Collect. I don't know if that exists right now uh, with a cell phone. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, that's reality. I called Collect from a, a public phone in a pizza uh, restaurant, um, Broadway and 14th. I can't forget that. And, uh, and well, uh, I, I told my mom, uh, Look, I auditioned, and I was accepted. And at home, I I really don't know how they celebrated at home, because I could only hear the shouts and say, no, come on. And it was like a, you know, a, a full achievement. And that was it. And I completed my school here in North Carolina as planned, came back to Uruguay on holidays, waiting for this contract that they had promised me. And then the weeks went by, and I didn't get the contract. And everybody knew that I was going to form part of the American ballet, but I didn't get the contract. And then finally, it got here. And then suddenly, you saw yourself in New York looking for a flat uh, with your insured legs insure, insured by the American ballet. I, I've never d had any skis in on my foot. Imagine if I break my knees. Uh, it's just still pending. I had never skied in my life. And then I started. you started forming part of, of that uh, mega team of the American Ballet, where um, you have seen excellence everywhere. You had to audition all the time to keep your position. Tell us a little bit about that process to form part of a company such as that one and how you worked in a, in a team, because I imagine that there were large teams for all that excellence to be seen. Well, the American Ballet is a private company. It offers annual and renewable contracts. But the fact that they are renewable doesn't mean that you are sure to get it the following year if you don't uh, comply and uh, fulfill your, uh, your, your tasks, as it happens everywhere. And, uh, and it, was, it was the first time, my first uh, labor experience was at Soldier, the National Uruguayan Ballet, but uh, that was not usual. And so to have the first uh, labor experience abroad in such a large company, well, I, I would, uh, you know, kick myself and say, well, how, how's this? And I could see how important it was uh, to work in a team, uh, importance of the organization, uh, to be aware of where I was and uh, who I was dancing uh, with and for. And, and to have this, this uh, this thing of saying, I want to do more, I want to go on growing, because otherwise this can stop from one day to the other. And, and I had that responsibility of, it's just in my hands uh, to keep my job going. Uh, did you leave that all right, or did you feel it was a high pressure? Well, no, that was the usual thing. I, I think that that's, all, that's healthy, in fact because you are uh, becoming and overcoming things constantly, not to be afraid of not having it, that it may run out and may stop, but to say, I deserve the place where I am, because I've really uh, broken my neck in all this. There was a strong job. We would start at uh, quarter past 10 in the morning. We would leave at 7 in the evening. And uh, there was very little time to, to for lunch. And perhaps you had all the rehearsals together. And um, you would eat your lunch uh, uh, from time to time. It wasn't healthy, but that, it was it. That was it, at least at that time when I started. 
And then we started working in a different timetable. This is the timetable we have. We're going to stop for 45 minutes to have lunch and then um, uh, reconvene. But that was what we had. Uh, it was full of intensity, being fast, solving, deciding, sometimes going out on the stage without much preparation. But that was a very quick uh, rhythm and pace. It was interesting. We also had a long working day, and we were working with four different ballet groups at the same time. So you had to be very versatile. Um, it was much for the body, for your art. And then you had to continuously compare yourself with uh, very, very uh, efficient dancers who would set the standard, and you had to do your best. And that was inspiring. In the meantime, you became an adult, you solved your life, you, with your self-salary, did you buy a second-hand TV set or a mini component, as we called it at the time? Yes, it has five things that would turn. Very beautiful. But the TV set was second-hand. Yes, I knew that. So you were organizing your New York lifestyle. I arrived there with nothing. Nothing, literally. And then you started traveling worldwide with this company that performed at the most relevant uh, theaters in the world. Yes, that was beautiful. I traveled a lot. I worked with choreographers that were outstanding. And I felt that culturally that was very w enriching as a human being in, in my spirit. So that was my wealth. So at that very relevant point of your career, you also had some pain when you heard that your mother uh, had cancer. And while you were traveling in Japan, she passed away. This is the time when we start crying. Uh, I, I always cry, yes. It's hard. It was a very important moment in your career, but you got this sad news from Uruguay. Her mother not only supported her and encouraged her to carry on, but also, I understand that she was also uh, paying attention to rehearsals. That was a time when there were no cell phones, but mother was always there supporting. Well, my whole family, and this is something I always mention, in all aspects uh, of my life, family, family support is fundamental. And in such a discipline as ballet, or sports, um, high performance, where you spend many, many hours and there's a lot of physical dedication. You need people to accompany you, to support you, to accompany to school, to, who waits for you while you are in the class, who prepares your meals. That was my family. My father also sacrificed um, holidays. Holidays were very important. My father would come and go from Durazno to Montevideo, so um, holidays were sacred moments. And he had to give that up because I had a rehearsal or I had a performance. And my father had to abandon many things. And my mother was a a good friend. A mother is a mother. She knows everything about you, where you are, when you leave. And that was something I missed a lot when I didn't have her by my side. She knew I was going on a trip, but now nobody calls me. This is what I always mm, told my sister. Um, 
mother always knew where I was or what I, I was about to do. So it was hard, painful, that's life. It was 20 years ago, but at times I think it was yesterday, or sometimes I feel it was 40 years ago. You said, my mother is always there, sitting in the first row. I remember, very touching when you, I heard you say that. Did you ever feel like you had to abandon everything and come by your mother? Well, I had several moments when I said, yes, I will abandon everything. I quit, I go back. I miss them a lot. But if I, I now I think if I had enjoyed those 15 years fully, maybe the story would be different. But every single minute I had a free moment, I would come. I would come to Uruguay. I always um, imagined that I was going to come back to Uruguay. I thought of retiring in Uruguay, going to the beach, but not yet, not yet. But I need to relax a little bit. I always had a very strong link with this country, with my friends, with my family. And there were many, many times when I really uh, questioned, should I quit or and go back? But then I started analyzing, and it was always the ballet that won.
Pará, no te vayas. Ella es... She is Melissa Oliveira. She's first dancer at the National Ballet. I became a little anxious, sorry. I'm very happy to see you here sharing this moment. She's a wonderful star of ours. Uh, so please go and see her in our next um, dance, in our next ballet. This is for you. Go, now you may go. <laughs> She's beautiful. I got nervous. <laughs> In 2012, somebody else changed your life again. Julio Boca, a dancer, dancing master from Argentina who created a revolution in Valley in Uruguay. You danced together at the Conrad Hotel, then you went to the States, but in 2013 he offered you to come back to Uruguay, so you returned. Um, and you had um, a leave of absence at the American Valley for one year to test your stay in Uruguay. You left as a girl and you came back as a recognized world dancer at the American Ballet and in worldwide. And they offered you this possibility to come back to Uruguay. Uh, but after living in New York, you had to come back to Montevideo. How was that? Well, that's when you realize that things are somehow marked. For a long time, I was willing to come back. I had a wonderful life in New York, and I love that city. I have it in my heart. I, I love New York. But I always wanted to come back to Montevideo. So the fact that Julio became the director of the Uruguayan Ballet company, the fact that he needed a prima ballerina at the time, and the fact that we were uh, colleagues in the American Ballet for quite some time, uh, led me to start considering this is a very good idea. So I asked for a leave uh, for one year, and I said, I want to try this. Sodre, as the theater was completed, the building was completed, Julio called me and he said, I don't want to be the reason why you make this quick decision, but I would like you to be part of this. So I was granted the leave, and I came to Uruguay. Uh, with one condition. I arrived in July, and by December, I had to let them know uh, whether I was going back or not for the following season. So what happened? Well, things developed and occurred. I knew that professionally, it was going to be wonderful to work with Julio to reconnect with the Uruguayan audience, to dance at the National Auditorium. We had been waiting for this new building for a long time. But I was afraid of coming back to Montevideo. I could not compare it to New York. There was a big difference. Um, that was 11 years ago. I came back in 2012. So I said, I'll try. But my family, my friends were here. I was in a beautiful theater, being part of a real company. And not that Sodri was not like that before, but the conditions were such that we had a very good repertoire, good working conditions, good masters. So I wanted to come back. And in December, I remember I had a chat with Julio, and he said, look, Maria, the position is yours. But uh, until I get a contract from you, I, I don't have that position. And I remember we were going to Punta del Este to a show at uh, the Achugarri Museum. 
And he said, all right, you've got my contract. And that's when I decided that I was going to stay in Uruguay. And I made the call to the US to talk with my former, who, who the person who was going to be my former director. And I remember that I started talking and talking. And at a certain point in time, he said, don't tell me anything else. You are going to stay on. I can hear your voice. You are extremely happy. And so that's, that's when we started thanking each other. And I hanged, and uh, I uh, cried a little bit. And I said, oh, that's it. That's it. It was funny, because all my um, colleagues in the US knew that I wasn't coming back. And talking about um, thanks and important times, in 2017, you were awarded in uh, a prize in Moscow by the Bolshoi, together with Julio Boca. Uh, and you were there with your partner, with Nacho. And uh, you were awarded uh, the prize, which is known as the Oscar of Dances, Paul Benoit. This award, we, we also saw you that you were very moved. <laughs> And you say, is it a time when you say everything was worthwhile? Well, yes, I, I've never given any importance to awards and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. That um, My largest recognition was the applause of the audience after a performance. And I, and I think that all along my career, I lived for that magical moment when uh, a performance uh, stops. The same thing that happened to Melissa, you know, they didn't know them, uh, they didn't know this public, and, uh, and when something finishes and the, and, and the public claps, it's a question of energy that you can't explain, and I, and I enjoy that until the very last moment. The Benoit was an award by itself, you know, to, to have been shortlisted and to have uh, and to have been invited to dance in that gala performance. Uh, there was a possibility, but I didn't have any chances, I thought. However, that uh, uh, award was shared with an Argentinian dancer. We both won, and it was very magical. And also, what happened here was very strong. I think it was the first time that I felt that... Uh, that people recognized me. And that was very important that I was recognized because I was a dancer. Ballet is, isn't a very popular discipline. Well, next to my place, they had put your a giant face of yours in a, in a newsstand. So it was something incredible that happened with you. On the 28th of December, 2019, you said goodbye to the stage. Uh,
destruida. I always cry when I watch this video. My God, 30 years, because music is, is wonderful. And this is something that I always wanted to dance and dance it for the first time and for the last time. Uh, I watch this and I say, oh my God, I would probably put my uh, ballet shoes to do it again. And music is very strong and, uh, and the images are, are very moving. I don't miss dancing. I cry, but I don't miss it very well. Do you prepare your retirement, did you, psychologically, emotionally, to do all that? Or does it happen and things move quickly and uh, adrenal adrenaline and, uh, you know, you, you devoted your life to it? I think that my retirement was prepared right from the beginning I started dancing, when I was aware what ballet meant for me. I always had very clear in mind that I wanted to retire at the top at the surf of the wave. Uh, Julio Boca had, uh, had gone away from the company at that time. I, I felt, you know, routine was becoming heavy. You were tired, yes, because to dance at the level I wanted to dance and that I had been, you need a lot of effort and a lot of preparation and uh, you have in, 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 in shape. And, uh, and when you are of a certain age and you feel that your body is abandoning and, and it's very ungrateful in your, in your career, it's the physical part that abandons you, but the artistic side goes on growing. Um, when you are artistically at the top of your career and your body doesn't accompany, you and to realize that and to see other generations. I shared uh, the last few years as a prima ballerina, and I think uh, it was my last year when she was promoted. So to see younger generations full of talent that need space also. And I was uh, occupying a lot of space, and I'm very grateful for it, but it wasn't necessary to uh, do it any longer. And I left as I wanted. I was prepared physically. I had a personal training. I had a nutritionist. I, because I wanted to be wonderful. Excellence. Yes, and I did. And I did it. And then three years later, I see little <laughs> rolls here. And, uh, and, uh, and three years ago, I didn't. And that happens. But it was wonderful. And uh, and that last year, last that last performance was um, pure enjoyment. I don't recall anything, but I recall everything. I wasn't nervous, but I felt I, I I remember the previous performances, and I would look up and look at the lights in in the theater, and then suddenly I would look up and look at them, Maria Noel, because you're not going to see them again. Or I would put my ballet shoes and, uh, well, put them on because in a week's time, uh, that's it. And I took off my shoes on the 28th of December in 2019. I put them in a box together with everything I took out from my uh, dressing room. And I didn't touch anything after that. Everything is there. So I have to go into therapy uh, to open that box again. I think that uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going over this morning time um, now. And as a director, I realize I don't form part of the group. And to conclude, I would like to ask you, how is it that now that you are the director of the National Ballet to, to be in this other position, uh, to look for excellence in your team? Well, it's difficult. It's very difficult. Uh, this question of closing one stage and trying to learn from another place and to have the time to uh, leave when you are at the top of your performance and to take another position and learn 
once again, start again. Well, it's been very challenging and very difficult. I suppose that it's going to go on being difficult because uh, leadership isn't easy and I'm learning lots of things. I also feel that there are high expectations on all this because I was somewhere else not long ago. And it's interesting to see how when you are on one side, you don't imagine what happens on the other side. When you're on that other side, you realize everything that you have to do so that they are all right in this side. And that's very interesting. I enjoy what I'm doing. I love it. And I also have that same thought when I'm tired and uh, I don't want to do anything else. It's going to be all right. And other things will come in, other challenges. A big round of applause for Maria Noel Ricetto, please. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you.